Hello. Hello. Uh, and thank you all for coming to, to this um, session of the presentations that I do here uh, in Holliston at the Senior Center. My name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who haven't seen me before, I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, there are 60 of us, um, 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro. And there's so many that everybody does something special, and what I do is elder law, which is pretty much everything that I do. Um, so usually these sessions are designed as educational sessions about a particular piece of law. This one's a little bit different though. Uh, we're talking today about dementia-friendly communities and creating one. And the reason why we're doing this, um, well, I, as brief background, I started doing this kind of work after my mother died in a nursing home back in 1991, after she progressively got more and more dementia at home, and I watched it all play out with my father getting more and more upset and my mother quieter and quieter and the kids trying to avoid the whole thing saying, oh my God, this was really terrible. And so I'm still feeling guilty about that, which is one of the reasons I went into Eldola. Um, and most of the clients that I deal with are people who are either worried about getting Alzheimer's or another disease that causes dementia or they already have it or one of their loved ones has it. That's kind of a, a lot of what I do. And I try to help people solve the, some legal issues related to that, typically issues around asset restructuring and qualifying for government benefits. But really, what is, I think, more important than that is more globally seeing if a person like me, if I come to be like my mother or like my older brother who is 78 and has a, an early stage dementia diagnosis, um, if the question is can people continue to live at home even though their memory is getting worse and worse, and live a happy life. As I always tell my clients, the good thing about dementia, you know, if I had to choose between a bad memory and a bad back, I take a bad memory. The nice thing about dementia, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Tough part about it though, it goes for a long time. It's progressive, it can get very depressing because you know it's progressive. But the question is, can you, can you how can we structure things so that day at a time, you can live a good life? So. Um, I'm typically talking about my friends Frank and Mary. If you've been here before, you know them. They're my, they're my make-believe couple, although I, I have to say the person who drew these um, was, is my uh, paralegal son. And whenever I look at them, they look a lot like my parents. Now that I <laughs> appreciate it. Um, so this is Frank and Mary, and their goal is very simple. They want to live in their house until they die, and they want to be buried in the backyard. And they're getting older, and, and that's not an uncommon goal for a lot of people, right? Um, but the question is, if Mary starts losing her memory, if she starts exhibiting early signs of dementia caused by any one of these diseases, so how can she be living a happy life for the rest of her life? How, what, what does that look like? Well, you know, first of all, we're not talking here about the magic cure. Now I know you see the ads on TV. Everybody, every drug company, every big drug company is looking to be able to find the magic cure because they're going to make a gajillion dollars if they can produce something that's going to reverse the brain cell uh, deaths <laughs> that occur as a result of Alzheimer's and other things that cause dementia. I'm not thinking about this happening in my lifetime. I'm, I'm, I'm 66. I don't think so, right? Maybe but certainly not in the lifetime of my big brother who was 78. And so what we're talking about here is not the magic cure. We're talking about how can you make this a place so that if you have dementia, you're still okay. Now, we've talked before here about how you can help your, make your home better, how you can make it safer. I think we even had a woman named Carol DiRienzo who was a woman, she and her husband, they help people who have dementia try to figure out how to make their house safer through a whole bunch of different adaptations. And you can do that. But the question is, once you walk out your door and you're in your neighborhood, how do you want your neighborhood to change? And I, I'm not going to give you, I can't give you all these solutions, um, but I can talk about some things that other people have tried. And the reason, by the way, while we're talking about this, is that there are three communities here in this area, Marlboro, Hudson, and Northboro, who are now all trying to figure this out. Um, they are trying to become so-called dementia-friendly communities. Um, they, this started as a result of some research that we had done where we found that there actually has been an initiative going on in Minnesota now for about five or six years through which the state has been encouraging communities, community by community, to develop their own plan to become dementia-friendly. 
Um, so actually, Myrick O'Connell paid to have the th those the three council on aging directors from those three communities, Marlboro, Hudson, and Northboro, go to Minnesota together with the woman who runs Bay Path Elder Services, a person who has been here before. Bay Path Elder Services is that the aging services access point, the regional nonprofit that is in charge of, of dealing with, with um, the distribution of, of elder services, of elder services money uh, in this whole area, including Holliston and including those three communities. So we all went to Minnesota and we got sold on the fact that this actually worked, that this wasn't smoke and mirrors what they were trying to do. And then came back and, and um, um, Christine found some grant funding through the Metro West Health Foundation through which uh, each of these communities, these three communities, is now trying to develop their own plan and, and in their own community. And then Bay Path, um, through this grant, is actually paying for the staff for that, uh, who is Cindy Cormier, who is actually here today. Um, so she's going to talk for a few minutes um, about what they are doing. But as this has happened in those three communities, numbers of people have said, dementia-friendly community, that really sounds nice. But what does it mean exactly? What does it mean exactly? So some of the things you're going to hear from me are my thoughts of what it means exactly. And others are actually what people have tried in other places, things that are working, right? Kind of, and it, the way to think about this, really, is to think about our friends Frank and Mary in a set of different places. What does their neighborhood have to be like in order for Mary to feel still good about that neighborhood? Well, first of all, I think her neighbors need to know what dementia is. They need to know what Alzheimer's is. They need to know that you can't catch it, right? That it's still okay to talk to people who have got dementia and that there are things to talk to them about. That you need to kind of change the way that you may be talking to them because you don't want to be saying a whole lot of times, oh, you remember me, Mary, don't you? Don't you remember my name? Well, no, actually she doesn't, you know? And, and so that isn't a kind of a helpful conversation. Um, but folks who don't have memory and have trouble anticipating the future, which is the other piece of dementia, haven't lost their sense of the present. So conversations with them around the present and around the sights and sounds of the present, what a beautiful day, what a great bird, how, how beautiful the trees are today, are all things that the neighbors can share with Mary, even if they can't share some of those old memories. But what that really means is they need to be aware they need some training in how to have that conversation so that Mary isn't embarrassed. Because the goal of the exercise, one, one of the things that we think we've all learned about dementia, we all thought that dementia involved a, a, a big set of symptoms. There were the physical symptoms. The big one, of course, is you can't remember. And as things go on, you can't remember more and more things. And kind of as it gets to the end, you can't remember to do things like, you know, you can't not remember brushing your teeth or put on your clothes or any of these things. But then there's this other set of things which are really secondary. And they are aggression and apathy and, and, and depression. These are all not direct symptoms of dementia. They are simply the, rea the reaction that a person has either to themselves because they're getting so bummed out because they can't remember or to other people because they're reacting to how other people are dealing with them because they have dementia. That we can deal with. That we can deal with. Perhaps at the neighborhood level. Or, so now who else has to be part of this? Certainly the police. The police have to be part. In a dementia-friendly community, if you get lost, you're going to get found. If you walk, start walking down the street and one of your neighbors hasn't spotted you and you end up walking but to, you know, farther and farther, the police are going to be able to find you. By the way, one of the interesting things that I, pieces of trivia that I learned about dementia is that one of the ways the police can find you, is it, 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 the, the, when you get to a corner, if you have dementia, the way that you'll go is based on whether you're left-handed or right-handed. If you're right-handed, you'll always take a right. If you're left-handed, you'll always take a left. So if you, if you want to try to find somebody who has drifted away, you just start walking whichever way they would go, and you typically can find them, right? So you need to have the police who are involved. They, now, they need to be able to know how to spot somebody who has dementia, who is walking down the street, who looks a little bit confused. They also need to know how to react if the person with dementia at 2 o'clock in the morning has knocked on their neighbor's back door 
wanting to get in. This particular incident happened recently, and a person in Georgia answered and shot the guy. Um, a lot of guns in Georgia. So, but there, 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 you know, the quest, there, there, that's a real question, and it's important once again to be knowing your neighbors in that case, right? And to be having the police and other folks involved in helping people know who has dementia so that you know who looks like a robber and who's just got dementia, right? Another piece of this, um, which some communities have gone into, is every community now has GIS, Geographic Information Systems. I would uh, guarantee you that your assessor's maps are now on GIS. I would bet there's a big assessor, which means that every person, every parcel that exists here is on a big electronic map. And GIS has the capacity to basically create data layers, to create layers that go on top of that map electronically, right? But every person with dementia, like all of you, lives someplace. So if this were really a community goal, and if it weren't so embarrassing to admit that you had dementia, then, and, and so you reported, oh yeah, you know, I've got early stage dementia. You know, in case you know, something goes wrong, help me out. We could do a map of everybody. We could do a map of everybody in Holliston, which means we could also try to find, for everybody who has dementia, a neighbor who lives close by who's going to have some responsibility for that person, right? Or somebody that we can call. Um, we can also do things like, actually, the, the, there, is a, there is a program nationally called Safe Return that many police departments have, have adopted. I don't know what the situation is in Holliston, where you can actually register with the police department. Uh, and so they'll have a picture on file of you um, so that if, you get, if they find that you are lost, they'll know who you are. Now, it may not be necessary in Holliston because it's a pretty small town. Although, you know, you find after a while that every place is a small town. So the police may very well know everybody. That's one of the jobs of the police is to actually know who you are. But the point is there are, there are programs that you can really focus on once you've decided that this is important. Similarly for the firemen um, who show up at the door if there's an emergency. By the way, did you ever wonder why? Now, in Holliston, I don't know the answer to this. I'm supposed to. Um, do, do they do their own ambulance service or is there a private ambulance service? Does the Holliston Fire Department show up with their ambulance? Yeah. That's great. That's great. And the reason, the reason why I ask that is in other communities like Marlboro, where it's a separate private ambulance service, whenever there's an emergency, the fire department has to show up anyway, whenever you dial 911. Anybody know why that is? Well, n not quite. It's because the fire department, the fireman is the only guy who is allowed to break down the door without a warrant, right? Police can't go through the door without a warrant, right? Fireman, it's a safety thing, right? So the, so the point is when the fireman gets there or, or the local ambulance, and, and either because he's in his truck or he's in the local ambulance and you're on the floor because you fell down or whatever and you have dementia, the first question really isn't what happened. Wrong question, <laughs> you don't know, you got dementia, you know? So figuring, ha having the firemen trained to deal with that, and I think one of the things you would find, m maybe this is not like other fire departments, but in others that I have talked to, like my own in Marlboro or in Hudson, there's a, a, almost kind of a joke about the frequent flyers. Oh yeah, so-and-so, she's a frequent flyer, you know, we're there all the time. These are typically people with dementia, right? Who have got problems and they're there all the time. These firemen though have had no training in terms of dealing with that, right? They need to be sympathetic too, as do the folks from the ambulance department. They need training. Ideally, they need to have knowledge ahead of time. This goes back to that notion of actually, if, if this is not an embarrassment, have people acknowledge that they have dementia so that the firemen know where they are, so that the frequent flyers aren't as frequent, or so that you know when you're there, that you, or, and if there's a list, you also can be calling the person who is their healthcare proxy. Typically, the designated daughter. Why, in but my business, I always find that it's seldom the son. Sometimes it's the son. Usually, if it's not the spouse, there's a designated daughter, right? So th those are things that you can do. Or if you go to the hospital, one of the standard problems at the hospital, person with dementia goes together with their, not, not so much with their spouse, but with their child, uh, because they get hurt. So now they're in the emergency room. This happens all the time, right? They're in the emergency room. They're talking to the triage nurse, and the triage nurse is talking to them. And there's the son who, or the daughter with the healthcare proxy. And the nurse says, so what happened? Oh, nothing. Nothing happened? Well, why are you bleeding? No, nothing. I'm fine. I'm fine. And the daughter is next to her going, dementia. 
<laughs> then that, but the triage nurse keeps talking to that person because their obligation, their thinking, and, and they're trained, there are confidentiality issues here. I'm only supposed to be talking to the person who got hurt. I'm not supposed to be taking direction from others. So to have that kind of training at the hospital where it hasn't necessarily happened, that's a really, it's a really important piece of all of this. Um, training and if you're at the local hospital, ch I mean, chances are if you're going to the hospital here, you're going where? Are you going to Milford? Where would you go from here to the hospital? Mostly. Probably. Mostly Milford? Which means most of you folks have got, there are records in Milford of you, right? And they may have, you know, records of your previous times there and why you were there. But to have them know, to have something in the file that indicates that you have dementia is going to have, make it a lot easier for them to process you, right? Because they're going to know who to call. They're going to have a sense of how this works, right? So the hospital, while it's not in Holliston, really needs to be a part of this if it's going to be a dementia-friendly community. Similarly, when you go to your doctor, there aren't that many doctors who are general practitioners here. I bet if I went around the room right now and you named who all of your doctors are, I would have found about 50% of all the doctors, right, who deal with folks around this area who are general practitioners. There just aren't that many. So the question is, I guess there are a couple of questions. First of all, are the doctors screening for dementia um, when you go for your annual visit? Now, it, it used to be uh, that the answer to this was no, um, because they weren't well, that, this sounds crude, because they weren't getting paid for it, right? Because what Medicare would pay them for these annual visits was so small. That has changed as a result of a, a recent um, ruling by CMS. Um, but to have this be simply part of your checkup, it's like doing your blood work and figuring out your weight and stuff. As you're getting older, is to see how your memory is doing, to see if there's something that they're picking up that means that means, and they're trained to, 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 to that level, that means that maybe you need to talk to a specialist. Because if you have dementia, you shouldn't be assuming, as many doctors do, that the dementia is caused by Alzheimer's disease, right? There are seven or eight different causes of dementia. Alzheimer's causes about 70% of those cases. But if that's not the cause, then it, it may very, then, the, then the solutions may be very different. And I'll give you the classic case, which is Louis, Louis, so-called Louis body dementia. Louis body dementia. The, the, this, the, 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 anybody here heard of Louis body dementia? Raise your hand. Oh, that three out of about 15, that's, that's much higher than usual, <laughs> right? I've heard Louis body dementia referred to as the most common disease that no one's heard of, right? Um, its, major I mean, its major cluster of symptoms is, are dementia symptoms but it also causes hallucinations, right? That's a whole other, and, and so that some of the things that, some of the drugs that you may be using, some of the things, if, if you have dementia and it's not Lewy body, are gonna have some really bad consequences if you got Lewy body dementia. So these are things that you really need to know. I remember recently reading Robin Williams, the, the comedian, right? Uh, apparently that's what he died of. He, he had dementia symptoms. The disease apparently was Lewy body. Imagine Robin Williams having hallucinations I mean, <laughs> the thought of that is really scary. So you want to be able to have doctors who are general practitioners and at least as important, their nurses trained in this, right? And by the way, that's a piece of what folks are doing now in Hudson Marlboro and Northboro is kind of going sector by sector and trying to do questionnaires and find out from people in these different sectors kind of what they know about dementia and what they'd like to know about dementia. Um, so beyond those kinds of basics, though, what about the life that you can live if you have dementia? And one of the, and one of the goals, I think it should have been my mother's goal, was to get out of the house, right? And one of the problems is that typically, though, if you have dementia, you and your spouse are afraid to leave the house because you don't want to be embarrassed, right? You just don't want to be embarrassed. So one of the things that has happened nationally has been the evolution of these things called memory cafes. And actually, the first one who did one in Massachusetts is, is located in uh, Marlboro. There's a woman named Tammy Pazariki. She has a, a, a day program for folks with early stages of dementia. But among other things, she does a, she does a memory cafe um, um, once a let's see, let's see if I got a picture. She does a memory cafe once a month for folks who have got dementia and their, and their caregivers. And the notion 
is to have a place that feels like a cafe, right? And that's a, the, and that you've got food um, and a little something to drink and to often entertainment, right? And, and a place where folks who have early stage dementia and their caregivers can meet each other, right? It can meet each other so that you can just kind of talk to each other and get a sense of, among other things, if you're a caregiver, of who's who. And if you have dementia, so you can talk to somebody else with dementia. Because among folks who have dementia, if you're talking, it's pretty funny. You know, you just get a whole bunch of people who've got dementia and they can't remember really well. I know one of the, the so, I, I'm, so I'm a product of the 60s, right? So without going into any stories, early stage dementia seems to me a lot like being stoned. It seems to me you're kind of in a situation where you're having trouble remembering things and you're having trouble anticipating things. And so sometimes you kind of get into the middle of a sentence and you kind of can't remember where you are. Now, when you're 18 years old and you've been smoking dope, that's pretty funny, right? Because everybody else in the room is, is, is saying, oh, yeah, that's really funny. If you're, if you're 65 and you, that happens, they're all like, oh, my God, this is terrible, you know? You have dementia. Well, you know, if there's a room of people filled with folks who have dementia, it, it changes the conversation, right? So these memory cafes have become very pop, popular. I just want to go back, though. It, um, and, and by the way, there's an there's a organization now, and if you, I'm thinking if, there's a, if you Google, Google something called the Percolator, P-E-R-C-O-L-A-T-O-R, -O um, there's a group at um, Jewish F uh, Commu Family and Community Services in, of Greater Boston that has actually undertaken to coordinate all of these. So they've actually got a website for people who want to create a memory cafe or who already have them so that they can kind of learn from each other, right? Because one of the goals, I think, of the memory cafes is to have enough of them so that if my wife and I get up and, you know, if, if Frank and Mary get up in the morning on Saturday or Saturday and they know it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they want to go to a memory cafe. They don't want to go to the same memory cafe all the time and see the same people, you know. But if there's a bunch of them within 10 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you know, the house, well, maybe they can go to one in Framingham. They can go to one of, of course, maybe they didn't remember the people from last week. That's also true. Okay. But, it may, but there may be a bunch of them. So that's kind of what is evolving. But beyond that, let me see if I got my new slide. Yes. What an ideal place to have a memory cafe in a cafe. Like Jay Arthur's, um, this is a memory cafe in Roseville, Minnesota. Uh, and you can find this on their website. So they're a regular cafe. Um, but on Saturdays from 2 to 4, right, when how many people are in the restaurant on Saturdays at 2 to, 2 to 4, right? There's nobody there anyway. So they've, they've developed once a month a memory cafe and they encourage people to come, right? So they're like making money, not a lot. You know, they're interested because I think one of the folks there, the, one of the relatives has dementia, right? But we have found in some of the communities that we're in that they're doing this right now, some real interest among some restaurant owners, right? to do something like this on the off hours. Maybe Dunkin' Donuts could do it, you know, and it could happen <laughs> nationally. Every 10 minutes you could find a memory cafe, right? Because it's Dunkin' Donuts. So, so it, and in that, in, in that ca cafe, so you, what do you need for it to work, right? So you need the staff to be trained so that they're going to spot this. I mean, many, many people no longer go to their favorite restaurant because they had a bad something bad happened there because they were kind of losing their memory and a waitress didn't react well and everybody got embarrassed. You need a menu. You need, to, you need a menu that doesn't have 50 items on it. What you need is someone coming up to you saying, oh, Mr. Bergeron, would you like the chicken or the fish today? Well, I can handle that question, right? Or Mr. Bergeron, even simpler, the chicken's really good today. How about the chicken? Oh, okay. So you, you need that. You need signs so that folks aren't getting lost in this space. Maybe a special menu, maybe special hours. But the point is, only you know what's going to work that way in Holliston, right? There, it may be that there is a restaurant which is a natural, right? By the way, that's the scene from the Memory Cafe at J. Arthur's in Minnesota. Um, how about the grocery store? Everybody has to go to the grocery store. <laughs> dementia or no dementia, you've got to go to the grocery store. So can you... Can Frank and Mary be making going to the grocery store, which they've always done once a week, right, an experience that's still a pleasurable experience, right? Now, maybe Mary isn't picking the items at this point, but she's certainly running the cart. 
or if Mary is there by herself and she has early stage dementia, maybe we need some staff there. Maybe somebody there, at least at the cash register, needs to be trained to help her out, to help her with her change, right? Or maybe to help her find things. And, you know, we were talking to, to, to one grocery store, one, it's a supermarket actually, where they actually have somebody who is kind of designated to be the person that if someone's a little confused, they'll actually bring you to show you where the grocery is. Because, you know, if you've got dementia, to have someone say it's an aisle 12 is not going to help you, right? But to have somebody really be able to direct you um, and to help with your list. One of the, there are a couple of interesting examples, by the way, of, of, uh, of uh, grocery stores. In, um, in, I believe that this is in Dorset, uh, England, um, the, the, the grocery store manager decided to do this. He trained all of his staff. And the way he had wanted his staff to think about it, he said he wanted to create what he called mental, was it mental ramps, mental ramps. He says, you know, all grocery stores now, you never have to go upstairs to a grocery store, right? There's always ramps. You get it. They get it. If you've got that disability, if you're having trouble walking, you're going to have a ramp. Mental, that, what he's talking about is mental ramps. You know, you need a space where even if, you, you know, your memory is a little off, you can still do this thing comfortably. By the way, one other th interesting thing about the, the uh, and by the way, that, so that's my goal is to have that symbol. Frank and Mary welcome here, right? Very simple. Well, um, in New Zealand, there was a, uh, a chain of grocery stores that agreed to do this. And it being New Zealand, New Zealand's not that big, so the chain was like 17 stores around the two islands of New Zealand. And so, as part, so the, the person who, who was doing this, pro probably because it's actually because one of his family members had dementia, so he was interested, he got all of the store owners together to talk about what they were going to do in each of their stores. And he started off by saying, so has anybody here had a family member that had an experience with dementia? 15 out of 17 of those people had a family or close friend that had a person with dementia. And that's the reason why the notion of creating a dementia-friendly community is so possible, because there are so many people who have it. So many people who have it, right? What about the mall? When you're going to the mall, similar to the store, do you want, you know, is there signage? Are there people that are going to be trained so you're not going to get lost? If you're going to the drugstore, don't these folks need to know if you're going in to get your drugs, your prescriptions refilled, right? If you've got dementia, right? They, they need to be part of this. Um, the folks at Walgreens and Hudson are becoming uh, actively involved in this. What about if you're just going to the park, right? Or outdoors, you know, you're going beyond your neighborhood. Because what do you do when you are retired and older and doing stuff? You know, you're at home or you're at a restaurant or you're doing these other things or you're out walking. So one of the great things that you could, and so what you want from that park is certain things, right? You want to be able to get some exercises, but you need flat surfaces. You need it to be safe so that you can see things and so that your caregiver can see you if you kind of drift. Ideally, you need some bathrooms, right? At least if you're getting old like me, you know. Um, you need unobstructed views so that you can watch folks. And, and one of the reasons why folks are, in, you, you encourage folks with dementia to go to, to, to walk outside every day is they tend to, folks with dementia tend to start losing their day-night orientation. Just being outside helps them keep that. And, and together with the exercise, it helps keep, it keep people sleeping at night and being up during the day as opposed to the reverse, right? Which is a killer on a lot of caregivers because people kind of get out of that cycle. I'm seeing some nodding heads, so folks are aware of this, right? Uh, if you want to see some interesting ways to deal with this, look at the Seattle Parks Department, Seattle, Washington. They've got a whole dementia-friendly set of parks um, uh, design criteria, like the things that I was just talking about, and also actually activities, like just plain walks, right? Just walks on occasion for folks with the, who've got dementia and their caregivers, so that the walk becomes not only you're getting outside, right? But also, you're seeing people, right? You're seeing new people. So that you're, you're just kind of, you're keeping, both for yourself and the caregiver, you're keeping as much of life as possible, right? Now, these are things that in a community, like I know in one of our communities, it, as it happens, the assistant parks director, I, is their, their clients of mine, and his dad's got dementia. So they're really, he's really interested in this because he gets it, you know? But, 
if you're looking at it as a community thing, you really may be able to do this. Finally, the, the library, right? There are some terrific books that have been written about dementia, right? They need to be where people can get to them and get to them easily, right? And the library itself, like the parks, should be a space where you can come and feel comfortable, especially for folks, old people like me, right? Old people from our generation, whereas little kids, we went to the library. So it was always considered to be a very safe place, right? A great place to go and to have activities. What's the role of the senior center and the council on aging? A whole bunch of things. Many of these is programs like here. You've got programs going on here all the time. You've got day programs. You've got exercise programs. Maybe in a dementia-friendly community, there's one, there is, not, you're not only trying to be inclusive of folks who have dementia, but maybe there's a special program like the Memory Cafe for folks who are doing exercise who have dementia, right? The other great thing about the senior center is it may be one of the real centers for caregivers, right? Who can come and have conversations with each other about what to do. I mean, you've often heard, and I've seen, caregiver training for folks, you know, to, to, for caregivers who, have, who, have, who are dealing with folks who have dementia. But more important than the classic, you know, one hour class about that, is to be able to have a place where you can get together and talk to other people who are going through this and say, oh, you know what happened with Mary today? You know, I did this and she did this and it, things went really south, right? And so you, have you can get comments from other people who may be going through this. Probably one of the best places, <laughs> I like that. Every once in a while, my, this is my, uh, my, the folks who designed these get carried away. So, um, you, you want those kinds of connections to the community. You want things that are going on. You want dancing right here in the senior center. Um, <laughs> I know it looks like they're fighting. I, mean, I saw this when I said, well, this should be real. I love the dancing, but uh, this looks too violent. We may be, we may be getting rid of those, right? Um, um, no, I'm going to pass that. One other, one other thing about the community is the role of the assisted, li assisted living communities. Is there an assisted living community close by? Mm -hmm. right? I know there's a wonderful one in Hopkinton, Golden Pond. Who would, where, where would people go if they were going into assisted living from Holliston? Yeah. There's, one right Holliston. there's one right in Holliston? The, the resident. Does it have a, a memory care unit? Ashland, Ashland does. Ashland does? Oh, that's the new one, the right. Valley Farm. I know those folks. They're very good. Yeah. And there's a couple in Milford. I know there's a very well known one in Milford, but now, of course, it, being a little slow myself, I can't remember the name. Cornerstone. Yes, Cornerstone. That's right. That's right. So, in many ways, the best place to, to be doing training uh, around these issues is at an assisted living community, especially an assisted living community that has a memory care unit, because that's what their staff are doing every day and at the end of every shift typically their, their staff is getting together saying so what happened today and they're having that same kind of conversation Ooh, you know i dealt with mary today and there was a real problem and blah 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 so that they're constantly teaching each other that can be such a resource for the community for people who are in the community who want to be having that same conversation finally and by the way how am i doing for time I, oh that wasn't hard to figure out um <laughs> finally there is the nursing home. And I know everybody's goal, certainly Frank and Mary's, is, and I remember my mother, don't ever send me to a nursing home. You gotta promise me, whatever you do, don't send me to a nursing home. Parents have laid more guilt on more kids around this, <laughs> this issue, um, especially when my father had to send my mother to the nursing home because she broke her hip and my father couldn't take care of her anymore and it was just terrible. But Everybody agrees that they never, never, never want to go to a nursing home, right? Now, why is that? Among other things, it's because of everybody's mental image of what that nursing home is, which, by the way, is pretty close to reality in terms of what the current nursing homes around here are, right? So they're not, they're not terrific, right? And once people get to a nursing home, it's like a nursing home kind of has a, a moat around it, you know? And like, oh, they're gone. Mary's gone now. She's in the nursing home. I'm really sorry, right? <laughs> but I'm not going to visit because it's so depressing. I can't stand it, you know? So there are some th things that we need to be doing. F first of all, we need to understand nursing homes are not going to get the, gonna get better in general. And the reason is their funding is going to keep getting worse. 
And I feel kind of guilty about this because I'm part of the problem, right? Because I have told people in presentations like this here that everybody, everybody can qualify for mass health. And that's true. But as a result of that, an increasingly high percentage of all people in all nursing homes are on mass health. In many nursing homes, I think the average is between 70 and 80 percent here in Massachusetts, but some in run is over 90, right? And mass health pays crummy. They, they pay very, very low in terms of the daily rate they're paying to that nursing home, which means, and that's not getting better, right? Which means in the future, if there's going to be a good nursing home in town, it's only going to be because the community is supporting the nursing home, either because the community owns it, because it's a nonprofit, or because the community is providing extra services for it. Maybe the community is doing outreach with volunteers from the community because we're saying, you know, we're all in this together. You know, this is like Russian roulette. You get, you get dementia, anybody could have. So maybe you're really organizing folks to go and visit people in the nursing home. Maybe you're also paying for some things at the nursing home, like pictures on the walls. You never see pictures on the walls, right, in these places. Or parties, or some kind of events. Maybe in the long run, you're even paying for a different nursing home, like that one, uh, the, in, in, in a different model of nursing home. There is a kind of nursing home, and it's often referred to as the greenhouse model. Uh, there are a lot of them now, I don't want, not, not like a couple hundred, but a lot around the country. The model is basically that you stop having the nursing home being built on the so-called medical model which is historically where nursing homes came from. They came from looking a lot like hospitals for people who weren't quite sick enough to be there. But they're still really run by nurses and doctors and, 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 and medicine is the, you know, the big thing is safety. And so the whole idea of activities and all that stuff, very, uh, very ancillary. In the, in the greenhouse model, that's different. Instead, the model is really built about it being more like a halfway house. And so you typically have no more than 20 people in their own rooms built around some central kitchen dining room facility in which people, especially people who don't have really advanced stage dementia, are still helping out, doing the dishes, do all, a lot of, for a lot of the women, right? Because it tends to be more women because most of the men by this point are dead, right? So the older, that's why there's more women in nursing homes. Um, and and the people are eating together, right? And, and the care is being given by people who are more like social workers who are helping kind of with everything. Now that, that's, when I'm watching you, in your, I can see people saying, that's way different from anything I've ever seen, which is true. But the question is, is that the nursing home where you want to be, right? Where you want to be. Because if you're getting older and you're staying in Holliston and you might get dementia, there may be a point where you need to be someplace but home where do you want to be? So from that perspective, isn't that something that folks in Holliston would want to support? Wouldn't it be nice to know if you were living here and this ended up happening to you that this is where you would go and not to one of these other big places? So it's a thought. Finally, what about my friend Frank, right? In all of this, we've been talking about Mary. What does Frank need? He needs education so that he can be dealing with his wife just like my dad could have used some education, and I could have when it, was, when it was in our family. He needs some support because, boy, he can get really burned out. I remember my dad ended up having a heart attack about a month or about a, actually a week and a half before my mother died. My dad had a heart attack. He actually couldn't go to the funeral because he was getting better from the heart attack. That happens all the time. I keep telling my clients, you know, the worst thing you can do for your spouse who has dementia is to die. Because if you die, boy, a, the world becomes very, a very different place. So, and finally, he needs a life. He needs a life. He needs, he needs activities that he can go to. He needs some time off. There are a whole bunch of things that he really needs. Now, now, so we've talked about a lot of stuff. And there's training, there's facility, there's programs. And so where is the money going to come from? Well, you've got a couple possibilities. One is it could come from God, right? The money could just fall out of the sky. We could be saying we want these great programs and where's the money going to come? Well, a big grant is going to come. Where? From some foundation, right? Or you can think the government's going to give it to you, right? And you know, Bernie Sanders might give it to you. Donald Trump? I don't think so, right? I don't think so. So the answer to this question is, if these things are going to happen, they're going to be funded locally. They're going to be funded locally. 
from local companies, from local individuals, from people who die and give bequests, from people who are committed to the fact that if you're living in Holliston, you ought to be able to live this life even if you've got dementia. And that the only way you're going to make that happen is by making it happen together. Training facilities and money, they're going to cost dollars. But you need to figure out, first of all, whether there's any of these things that you really want to do. That's where um, the, what, this is the name that we've given to the, to the communities that are doing it here, Come to be Dementia Friendly, comes in. The staff person that got hired by Bay Path Elder Services to deal with the three communities that are developing their plans right now is her, is Cindy Cormier, who is here. And she's going to tell you a little, about, a little bit about what they're doing so that you can get a sense if you decide you ever want, do you want to go in this direction. Um, and I'm very appreciative that, Jean, that, that, that the, your Council on Aging Director is sitting in today just to kind of learn about this because I know this is being talked about among the Bay Path communities. Cindy. Thank you. Well, as Arthur mentioned, I'm Cindy Cormier, and I work with Bay Path Elder Services. They're the aging services access point for this area. And um, they were able to get a grant from the um, Metro West Health Foundation to bring me on to act as the coordinator for the effort we call in Come to Be Dementia Friendly. What it is, is it's a grassroots volunteer driven effort. It's not a Bay Path effort. It's not a, a um, Council on Aging effort. It really is a grassroots effort. Um, what we're doing is we hold a community meeting. Folks come that are either affected by Alzheimer, know somebody that is, or is just interested in the subject. We get those folks together. We talk about what the program is. And out of that comes an action team. We're using the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. As Arthur mentioned, they went out to Minnesota and they checked out this toolkit. Um, these folks put a lot of work into it. Out in, out in Minnesota, I think they've implemented 38 communities already. And you can go online and you can look at that toolkit and you can look at what's already happened out in Minnesota to kind of get an idea of what we could do here. The whole toolkit is online and there's also all kinds of other resources. There's things like training for the medical field, that type of thing. So they've done a lot of work. So we don't have to recreate anything, we just follow the toolkit. Right down to agendas for the meetings, all of it is there, so it's a great, great tool. Um, it creates a community of people with dementia and their families. It creates a community for people with dementia and their families that's informed, it's safe, it's respectful. These folks have a better quality of life. I have to talk a lot about what a dementia-friendly community looks like. Um, there's some other things that we t uh, talk about. That there's been a story that someone has told us about someone going to, that had dementia that was going to church, and that person was asked not to come to church anymore because they were disruptive. So, you know, it would be nice if maybe there was some other type of activity within the church these folks could attend if, you know, if they can't make concessions for that person. Um, I know folks with Alzheimer's enjoy music, so maybe it's more of a fellowship thing with music and not sitting through the whole service. Somewhat like what we do with the kids, and they have the kids service um, that keeps them, you know, keeps them involved but not necessarily disrupting the norm, I guess. Um, transportation. Wouldn't it be nice if the guy that drives the bus knows this person and knows that they're having issues and is able to say, you know, Sally, this is your stop, you know, and you're heading right over that way to your house instead of poor Sally riding around on the bus and not knowing where she's supposed to be getting off. So where are we going to do this and why are we doing this? Right now, we have the funding to do Marlboro, Northboro, and Hudson. These towns were picked because they're contiguous. They're also different kinds of communities. Marlboro is a city. Hudson's more, more rural. Um, based on the 2010 census, the total population of those three um, cities and towns was 71,717 people. The number of folks over the age of 65 is 9,397. One in nine individuals over 65 has Alzheimer's. That brings that number to 1,043. That number we know is much higher 
first because that was the 2010 census. The other thing is a lot of folks are not being diagnosed. I also have some other figures here I'd share with you. Um, I'm sorry. So some other things about this, the numbers around Alzheimer's is one in three over the age of 85 will have some form of dementia. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. And out of the top 10 leading causes of death in the U.S., Alzheimer's is the only one that can't be prevented, cured, or slowed. And the U.S. has spent $226 billion already on this problem this disease, I should say. So I'd mentioned the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. That's a four-phase process. We're currently in the three communities that we're working in. We're in the convene stage. So we've had a community meeting. We've got a bunch of folks really interested in doing this. Um, we've also talked to folks like Aspen Valley Regional Vocational School, their um, nursing program those nursing students are going to get involved in our second phase of the process, which is assess. So that's, an, that, that's a great way for them to learn and for them to help in this effort. So we're in the convene stage. Like I said, we're pulling the folks together. What you want to do when you're pulling an action team together is get a cross section of your community, people from different walks of life. We need first responders on there. We need medical professionals, nurses, social workers, those types of folks. We need caregivers. Um, we have store owners or, or shop owners, um, folks that work in retail, that type of thing. We are actually in Hudson, we have the police chief and we have the senior liaison officer. Um, so we're lucky to have both of those on my, our teams. The second phase is the assess phase. And that's where we go out and we actually survey the community. There's 11 different surveys that are contained in this Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. Again, we don't have to recreate the wheel. They're all there. Um, and they're based on sectors. So there's a specific survey for the healthcare worker. There's a specific survey for first responders. Um, there's a sur survey for caregivers. So there's 11 different surveys. And as I mentioned, folks like the students from ACIBIT will go be going out to survey folks. And we are creating sub-teams within that action team to also do that. Once folks have filled out those surveys, um, they're going to go back to Bay Path Elder Services, and they're going to use the tool that's part of the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit to analyze those results and provide a report to the community showing how that survey, what the survey results came out as. And then based on those survey results, the action team will look at it and say, Hmm, we really need some training in our first responder space. Um, we really need some help in our stores to make them more, user, more dementia friendly. Um, wouldn't it be nice if Market Basket could just assign somebody that's there to take the people around to do their shopping if necessary. So as Arthur said, so you know, once you decide what it is you need to do, then obviously we need to implement those things. And as Arthur said, you know, the money really is going to come from local, local folks, um, whether it be a business or a foundation or a religious organization. Um, I know that there are grants out there that are available too. In fact, Hudson Marlboro and Northboro have just recently submitted for a grant um, to do some of these actions based on their results. Holliston is not going to be next. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in the process of these three towns. It's going to take some time. We're learning through this process. But there's some things that you can do today to start preparing yourself. And one is education. Um, go on to the Act on Alzheimer's website. Go to Act, uh, the Alzheimer website. There's, is that in these those are all in there, yes. Um, the the uh, Bay Path Elder Services has a great website, their care, caregiver Metro West website. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Part of the problem is, is there's a lot of information, but people don't know that information is there. So educate yourself. Um, and if you're a caregiver, go to some caregiver training. 
and makes a big difference in your daily life. This is contact information, obviously, for Hudson Marlboro and Northboro. If you're interested, um, you can speak to folks there. You can email me at any time if you have any questions or, um, you know, any ideas or whatever. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring this program to your community very soon. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention, so, so as, as Cindy has pointed out, and why don't you stay up here just in case we've got any questions. As Cindy has pointed out, you know, there, there will be other communities those communities actually haven't been chosen yet. No. Um, so if, you know, if, if Holliston is really interested, and if you're talking to your council and Asian director and you're really interested, then you should talk to the folks at Bay Path Elder Services. Because we know that the folks at the Metro West um, Health Foundation have been really pleased with the results of this so far. Because those three communities that have ramped up, this has all happened within four or five months. I mean, we, we went out to Minnesota last September. Um, we had our first meeting among us in October. Everything has happened since then. It's moved very quickly, and there's been a really pop. It's been a very popular, positive response. So you may you may be interested in this. Um, am I going to have time? I'm not going to talk about that other stuff. Um, oh no, I am. I'm sorry. I'm going to take two minutes. Just two minutes talking about it. There is one we legal thing five. you should know. Every once in a while, the world changes. This is, you should know about this. Um, uh, there's a section of the governor's budget called outside section 11. If passed, it will dramatically increase the power of the Commonwealth to get reimbursed after someone dies for money that was spent on them by MassHealth while they were alive. The current law is if you uh, are on MassHealth because you're in a nursing home and you die, MassHealth has a claim to get reimbursed for whatever they spent on you, but only from your probate estate. Therefore, if you had an interest in a property, for example, you had a life estate on your house, but you had transferred the remainder interest in the house to your kids or to an irrevocable trust. This is very common. Or if you own a property jointly with your husband or your wife and you were in the nursing home, it was okay that you had that property because your spouse was still alive and you died and the property was held jointly. Your interest evaporates at the moment of your death and the, your, pus, your husband gets the property and there's no lien. Um, that's number one. Number two, when you die, whatever doesn't get recovered from your estate when you die, um, MassHealth can never recover. Well, and that's what I was just talking about. Uh, outside section 11 of the budget, of, governor, of the governor's current budget, would change that. First, regarding any property that you owned at the time of your death, any interest, whether it is a life tenancy, a joint interest, any of these interests, even though those interests will not pass through your probate estate, um, when you die, MassHealth will have a claim against those interests and will therefore have a lien on that property for the value of your life estate or whatever your interest was at the moment of your death. That is a significant change. It will affect everybody who qualifies for MassHealth as it's currently written as of July of this year. Whether or not you did, you did these documents before, nobody's grandfathered. Um, finally, if you die um, and there is a, an amount that, is owed, that, that, that MassHealth paid for you, and your husband or, or wife then dies later, a year later, five years later, 10 years later, and there's anything in their probate estate, MassHealth has a claim against that probate estate, against those assets in that probate estate for the total amount of what was paid on your behalf. Those are huge changes in the law. Um, as opposed to most parts of the law, um, um, most statutes that get proposed and they take a long time and is considered in the legislature and there's different groups and so it goes to a study committee and it takes five years. This is the budget. This is an outside section of the budget. It's a legislative change, but it's part of the budget. The budget will get passed in one form or another by July because otherwise the state can't spend any money, which means this section, something's going to happen to this section. Either it's going to get passed or it's going to, either it's, or it's going to get deleted from the budget or it's going to get changed but something's going to happen. If you're interested, so you should be following this issue. You should talk to your attorney about it. Uh, and you may want to talk to your, your, your state rep and your state senator about it to see how they feel about this piece of legislation. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. Cindy and I are available to answer any questions right now or afterwards. I, I know we started almost an hour ago, so I don't want to make people run over. Um, but once again, if you're interested in the Dementia Friendly Communities Initiative, should talk, you know, check on the website, talk about it. 
If this is right, think, of, think, of, think to yourself, is this right for Holliston? Thank you very much. Any question? Thank you very much. I hope that this was of interest, right? And, and if, it, if there's anything we can do, just personally, I think this is just really important. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you so much.